Hello everybody, my name is Ricardo Espaillat and welcome to my economics lecture series wherein we tackle the book Man, Economy and State by the great economist Mary Rothbard. So far we have been analyzing the first chapter titled Fundamentals of Human Action and today we're going to be talking about a very important section. I think the mo one of the most important sections within that section of Fundamentals of Human Action which is the formation of capital. This section is really important for two reasons. Number one, because it really incorporates all that we have learned so far. Hence, I really recommend that you see the previous videos or watch the previous videos before seeing this one because it will, it will provide you with the necessary context. However, if you don't have the time, which I understand because time is pretty scarce, I will do my best to provide the context of all the terms that I will be presenting. However, just know I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail as I do in the previous videos. Uh, the other reason why this video is so important is because it really shows you the importance of capital and human action. And again, human action is purposeful behavior, behaviors towards an end. It really shows you the importance of capital in human life and hence in the economic phenomena as a whole. And the reason why capital or capital goods are so important is because they make us more productive and hence they free up our time for, for us to pursue other ends. It is because of capital goods and capital that we can dedicate our time to watch this video and do other ends. If it weren't for capital goods, we probably would be every day harvesting our food and then eating it and that would be our day. We wouldn't have enough time to pursue other ends. But because of capital goods, we become more productive we can pursue other ends. In other words, capital goods free up time for us to pursue other ends. So that's why this section is very important. Now, when I talk about what is the formation of capital, there's a question, what is capital? What are capital goods? We understand why understanding capital is important. I already said it. But what, are, what is capital? What are capital goods? If we remember correctly, human action is purposeful behavior or behavior towards an end. And in order for us to obtain those ends, we need means. And those means can be divided in two parts. Directly serviceable means, which are called consumer goods, or goods of the first order. And then there are indirectly serviceable, serviceable means, which are called factors of production, producer goods, or goods of the higher order. And the interesting thing about the factors of production is that they can further be divided into three. We have the two independent factors, which are the land, and labor, and then we have capital goods, which are a function of land and labor. But it is through those three factors of production, again, land and labor independent, that we are able to, in the future, produce our consumer goods so that we can satisfy our wants and satisfy our ends. So that is what capital is. But to understand the formation of capital, we need to visualize ourselves and put ourselves in Robinson Crusoe's foot or feet or shoes, whatever the term is. And by us visualizing this, imagine the following. Unfortunately, Robinson Crusoe wakes up in his island and he's stranded there. And he realizes that he doesn't want to die today. He wants to continue living. He has the desire and the, the flame of life. He wants to views life and he wants to live. He's not giving up. And he realizes that in order for him to survive, he must eat a hundred berries today. In other words, he must produce a hundred berries. But because he's new to this island, and he doesn't really know much about berry picking, it unfortunately happens to be that Mr. Crusoe produces his 100 berries. However, in a time of 20 hours, which means up that he has a productivity level of five, or productivity output of five berries per hour, meaning that he has four hours remaining for him to sleep. In other words, right now, and Mary Rocker doesn't present this example initially, I decided to do so just to further illustrate the importance of how capital is free of time. Uh, he may rather presents Crusoe already with a higher level of productivity, but I think this will help because it helped me further understand it. But anyways, 
Right now, Crusoe, unfortunately, is in such a dire situation that all of his time that he has per day must be dedicated to the production of berries, of eating berries, and, his, and then he has left four hours of sleep. Right now, it means that Mr. Crusoe has no time available for him to pursue other ends. His life, in essence, for this first day is the production of berries and sleeping. Production of berries and sleeping. That's what his life is right now. Why? Because he doesn't have the time to pursue other ends. If, if he had the time, he could. But because he doesn't have the time to pursue other ends, he can't pursue the end of maybe going swimming, maybe building a bow and arrow. You know, he doesn't have the time. He can't save, he can't restrict his consumption, because if he restricts his consumption, he dies. He's basically producing for his subsistence level. All right? So let's write down his current productivity level here at the top just to remember how he started and how many hours it took him to get the berries. So it took him, so his output is five berries per hour and in order for him to get the 100 berries, hence, it took him a total of 20 hours. And of course, Mr. Crusoe, it's not like he's full with these 100 berries. No, he's hungry, but it's enough for him to continue his life. Luckily, the next day, after he has gained some experience and some tacital knowledge, as Friedrich Hayek would call it, and I recommend you look up who Friedrich Hayek is, pretty cool guy, very smart, he has the spirit that he was going to increase his productivity. He's out there, he's like, I'm going to increase my productivity because I learned how to get those berries. But besides that, he discovers a new part of the island, which has more berries. And he gets pretty pumped about this. He starts jumping around. He's like, yeah, I found your berries. And stuff like that. You know, he gets pretty pumped. And because of his experience that he acquired in the production of berries and the fact that he discovers new berries and he finds like a lot of berries, his productivity actually goes up. It happens to be that in 10 hours, he produces 200 berries, which means that he has 14 hours available for leisure. And of course, sleep is included in that leisure. But what happens to his productivity? His productivity, in essence, went up from five berries an hour to 20 berries an hour. Look at that increase in productivity. Yeah, that, that's plenty. That's awesome. And why is it awesome, though? Originally, so we have we have five berries an hour, and now we have a productivity of 20 berries an hour, which means that in order for Mr. Crusoe to just survive, just survive, and eat berries. How many hours would he have to dedicate? He would have to dedicate only five hours. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that Crusoe, because of this tacit knowledge that he gained from getting the berries, and the fact that he found him berries, he has added 15 hours to his life to pursue other ends. He now has that time, those additional 15 hours for him to pursue other ends. And it so happens to be that Mr. Crusoe decides to spend 10 hours working to get 200 berries so he can get a little bit more satisfied eating. And then he has 14 hours left for him to sleep, to maybe go for a swim, to look at fishes, etc. The point is that now he has time available to pursue other ends. Right? Awesome! So now Mr. Crusoe has more time. And it could possibly be that Mr. Crusoe could every day live this over and over and over again. However, Mr. Crusoe doesn't want that. Mr. Crusoe wants to dedicate even less time to the production of berries so that he has more time for him to pursue other ends, to maybe build a bow and arrow, to build a house, to build a canoe so that he can eventually get out of this island, right? And he thinks and ponders and reasons sees the data presented by his senses and conceptualizes and integrated in such a way that he comes up with the idea that he's going to build up an axe. And he predicts that by building an axe, he's going to increase his productivity, right? However, he also realizes that to build an axe, it's going to take him approximately about 10 hours. In our first case, where Mr. Crusoe was dedicating 20 hours to get the 100 berries and only had four hours left to, uh, to sleep. Could he have produced the axe? No, he couldn't. He couldn't. He was basically producing to his subsistence level. But in this scenario, 
where he has 10 hours, he gets 200 berries, and 14 hours of leisure. Can he restrict his consumption of 200 berries or of leisure to build an axe? He could. In other words, can he save? Can he restrict his consumption to later invest those savings in investing in cr the creation of an axe, in rearranging land and labor in such a way and expending energy so that you get an axe? Yes, he could. And Mr. Crusoe is that more that he decides, well, if it's going to take me 10 hours for me to build an axe, I can either restrict my consumption of berries, maybe I take two hours, uh, instead of working 10 hours a day in berries, I'm actually just going to work eight, which means that I'm going to restrict my consumption of berries by 40, because if I work for eight hours times 20, it's going to be 160 berries, so I restrict my consumption of berries by 40, or either I can restrict two hours of leisure, in order for me to work on the production of an axe. He can do a combination of these two. Alright? So, what, what does Mr. Crusoe do? Well, he realizes, well, I'm going to restrict my consumption in the present so that in the future I can have more consumption. I can have more berries. But besides that, besides the more consumption, he thinks of the free time that he will have available to him. He thinks, well, if I work for 10 hours in the future, if I increase my productivity, it means that I probably will have to dedicate a lot less time to the production of berries, which means that I'll have more time for me to pursue other ends. All right? Either way, it's a restriction of savings. It's a restriction of consumption, excuse me. And now it could also be that one day Mr. Crusoe decides to work for 16 hours, right? And he basically gets the 16 times 20, which is 260, or no, 320, sorry. He gets 320, and then he saves 120 for a day, and then eats him tomorrow. The point is, either way that you look at it, it requires a restriction of consumption. Guys, a restriction of consumption. He must restrict his consumption in order for him to save. And once he has those savings, he can invest. All right. So what does Mr. Crusoe decide to do? He's like, okay, I'm going to restrict my consumption. Instead of producing uh, 200 berries a day, I'm going to actually restrict that consumption of 200 berries a day. And I'm going to eat 160, and I'm going to work those additional two hours to the making of an axe, and it's going to take me a total of five days. After the five days, it happens to be that Mr. Crusoe's productivity increases to such a level that if he were to work for 10 hours, his reduction of berries actually goes up to 500, which means that his productivity is... 50 berries per hour. Which in essence means that if his productivity is 50 berries per hour, if he only wanted to consume the 100 berries which was necessary for him to survive, how many hours would he have to dedicate of his day for the production of berries? Two hours. Look at how, because of a capital good, and because of the tacital knowledge required, and because of reason, we went from a situation where it was taking him 20 hours a day to get the 100 berries, where now it takes him two hours. In other words, he now has a lot of time freed up for him to pursue other ends. His standard of living has increased. Before he was dedicating 20 hours to the production of berries, now he only has to dedicate two. Why? Because he produced a capital good. He took an indirect route, so to speak. He first build an axe, and then after building an axe, he decided to go to the production of berries. Which is fascinating. We see now how Crusoe's, Crusoe's personal economy is growing. But in order for him to do so, he needed to restrict his consumption. He needed to restrict his consumption either of the berries or of leisure. He could have easily continued just consuming and consuming and consuming every day. Every day he produced 200 berries, he ate the 200 berries, and then he went to the beach. He could do that every day. But because he restricted his consumption, he had the vision of building an axe, he decided to increase his productivity and hence increase his standard of living. So that's the important thing to realize. We see how his time is being saved. Went from 20 hours of, ne of necessary time in order for him to get the 100 berries to 5 hours to now 2 hours. And then after he has all those berries, he can start storing them up. And maybe those berries, one day he doesn't, maybe, maybe he works you know, 10 hours one day, and he now has had those, he has those 500 berries, right? He now has those 500 berries. He decides to just consume 100, 
and the remaining 400 berries that he has become like future goods. He's going to do 100 per day. He's basically saving himself time. Maybe the next day, since he already saved uh, five, 400 of those berries, he doesn't have to go out and get berries. You can dedicate the whole day to building a canoe. You see what I mean? The point is, it is because of the capital that allowed him to have some savings. And once he has some those savings, he's free to pursue other ends. All right? It could be, you see, he's just restricting, whenever he restricts his consumption, decides to produce a capital, that his productivity increases, it frees up his time. Now with that in mind, we understand that capital goods increase your output. They do, and then they allow you to pursue other ends. Great stuff. But let's go back in time and think about this. What is it that goes inside Mr. Rousseau's mind that he says, I am willing to restrict my consumption now so that in the future, five days from now, I have a higher consumption? What is it that happens in his mind? And that's what we're going to analyze. In other words, what are the determinants of his capital decision or of his decision to save, to later invest in an axe? What are the determinants? And it happens to be that those determinants are time preference and uncertainty. But we'll go time preference first and introduce it. So let's go to Mr. Rousseau's scale of preference. As a scale of preference. And evidently, if he told you, so look, I have 500 berries for you, would he take it? Yes. He values a lot of the 500 berries now. So, 500 berries in the present. What's the problem with the 500 berries in the present? He can't obtain them if he doesn't have the axe. He can't, because he's only willing to work for 10 hours. Why? Because of this utility of, of labor, the law of marginal utility. The more he works, the less he values that additional output that he gets. He's not willing to work um, the, the, the necessary hours in order to get 500 berries in the present. He doesn't. He's not feeling it. He probably can't even attain that. And then it so happens that he values, you know, a bit further down, 500 berries. 5 days from now, which in essence means in the future. This is a future good. He values more that than having 200 berries now, in the present. It's a present good. The reason why it's called future good and present good is because he has 200 berries now, but the 500 berries could only be obtained sometime in the future. So it's called a future good. Okay, so how does time preference come here into play? Why is it that he is willing to do the capital investment, right? He's willing to withhold his, uh, he's willing to restrict his consumption and wait five days in order to increase his production. Why is he willing to do that? It is because of his rate a time preference. And again, what is time preference? Time preference is the universal fact that is present in all human action that we prefer our ends to be satisfied now rather than later. That's the important thing. But what is the rate of time preference? The rate of time preference is basically how many future goods do we want in return to, in over the amount of present goods that must be given up. All right, let me write that down. Uh, Delete our productivity levels, I remember them. I hope so. So we have that our rate of time preference preference will determine whether or not we decide to embark in saving so that we can invest in making an axe and later increase our production. But in other words, the rate of time preference is that if we have present goods here that must be given up in our denominator, our numerator would actually be the net future goods 
received. What do I say net? From the universal preference of time, because let's say I told you, okay, look, you have to give up, and let's do it here because of why. You have to give up 200 berries. I mean, you will receive 200 berries in the future if you give up 200 berries now. All right? Well, evidently, you wouldn't do it. Why? Because of the universal, uh, uh, the universal factor time preference. We prefer our goods now rather than later. So, in other words, in order for you to give up 200 berries now, in order for you to give up 200 berries now, it means that at least you have to give me additional. So I'm saying, look, if you give up 300 berries now, 200 berries now, in the future you will have 100 extra berries, which means that you'll have a production of 300. Think about that. If you are a person, you're like, ah, oh, no. If you had a very high time preference, meaning that you would require more goods in the future in order for you to give up goods in the present, you would probably say no if you had a really high one. If you had a low one, it means that uh, you would do. You would embark in the capital investment. In other words, if I asked you, uh, viewer, look, if you give me $100 now, in a year I'm going to give you 101 You're going to be like, no. Because I really value my present right now and the ends that I can satisfy with those $100 that I'm not willing to give up those ends so that in the future I can only receive an extra dollar. But if I told you the following, look, if you give me $100 now and in the year from now I'm going to give you a million, you're going to be like, okay, take my $100 now. All right? Why? Because you value so much the additional future goods that you're going to get that you're willing to give up the restriction of your consumption by $100. Which means that your, high, your, time preference, your rate of time preference is at such a level that at a certain point, you're willing to embark in the capital investment. You know, you're willing to restrict your consumption because you believe that in the future, you'll get something that's worth more to you. And that depends all on your mind. But it so happens to be that Crusoe's rate of time preference, which in the end is, is this, the rate of time preference is your net future goods received divided by the present goods, the difference that you get, all right? It's such that he's willing to embark to get, he's willing to give up for five days his consumption of 200 berries, right? He has to work, uh, he's willing, yes, so that he can increase his productivity by uh, that amount of berries. He's willing to get an additional 300 berries per hour in the future for giving up now 200 berries. In other words, he's willing to give up 200 berries now so that in the future he can have an increased output of 300 additional berries. Which means, this simplifies to one and one half, it means that in order, in this case, Crusoe is willing to give up the consumption of one berry now so that in the future he can have one and a half more. You see? So that's basically the rate of time preference. Which, when we, the way that it applies is that when we look at our scale of preference, our rate of time preference comes into play here seeing the value. In other words, when we say there's 500 berries five days from now, the present value of that, in our mind, the present value of the future good, the value that those 500 berries have from now five days from now, is affected by our rate of time preference. If we had a very high rate of time preference, it could be that we value it less, that the present value of the future good is less than the present value of the present good. Hopefully this is making sense. I know, present value, future value, blah, blah. <laughs> but the point is, we discount. The rate of time preference is also the discount rate. In our mind, we discount the future goods to at a certain rate, right? And that is a subjective rate that we have in our mind. Okay, that's an important point, it's a subjective rate that we have in our mind. If we had a very high rate of time preference, it means that we really value the future. Then in order for me to give up my present consumption, you must give me a lot in the future. Which means that I'm discounting whichever future goods that I have in the future a lot higher. If I had a very low time preference, which means like, yeah, I sort of value the, the present, I do. But if you give me like even an additional more, I could give it to you. I could give you those present goods and in the future I get more. You see? You'll later see how the rate of time preference really is the interest rate in the future. We will get to that. But just understand that the rate of time preference says is how many future goods you must give me in order for me to give up a certain quantity of present goods. The higher the time preference, it means that you are expecting a lot more future goods in order for you to give up a certain amount of present goods. A lower time preference means that you don't necessarily 
um, need a lot of future goods to receive or net additional future goods to receive in order for you to give up a certain amount of present goods. Okay? So that is what would determine whether or not Mr. Crusoe would embark in this capital investment. It so happens to be that he values the additional increase in 300 barriers of production, which we went from 200 to 500, that's a 300 net gain, that he values that so much more that he's willing to withhold his consumption by the two hours of berries that he did every day. See what I mean? Hopefully uh, this made sense. We went from a production uh, output of 200 berries to 500 berries and that required an investment of time. He had to give, he had to give up a certain amount of time so that in the future he would have additional free time left. You can think about these at the end like that because those goods what they really represent are ends and those ends or can only be achieved if we have the time. What you're doing is an exchange of time. You're saying, I'm willing to invest 10 hours today, right, or in the next five days, so that in the future, I have more time available to me, right? And in this case, it, we went, you know, for him to get 200 berries, it, it, would, it was taking him 10 hours, right, 10 hours, and now in this case, it would take him, if he has an output of uh, 50 berries, it would take him four hours. You see, so we went from 10 to, to 4, which means 6 hours. Am I willing to invest 10 hours to later get an increased output of 6 hours? Yes. If you had a very low, higher time preference, you would actually be no. I'm only willing to give up 10 hours now to get out like 12 hours in the future. You kind of see how basically what we're trading off is time, but goods, and those goods represent time, okay? I know I went a lot into this time preference things, but it's important for you to understand it really quick. High time preference means that you require a lot more future goods in order for you to give up a certain amount of present goods. All right, lower means that you need lower future goods, net future goods in order for you to give up a certain amount of present goods. That's the rate of time preference. Now, the other factor that affects your capital decision is the uncertainty factor. How does uncertainty factor come into play? The uncertainty factor comes into play either by positively affecting your rate of time preference or negatively. So let's say that Crusoe, he's like, you know what? I am not going to invest in that axe. Why? Why am I not going to invest in that axe? Pretty simple. Because I believe that by exploring around the island, I'm going to find even more berries. So I'm not going to withhold my consumption or restrict my consumption so that I can later invest it in creating an axe. So we see how that affects his rate of time preference. He, in essence, you would have, he would require a lot more increase in output for him to, in the future, for him to give up the present. So that's how it possibly affects the uncertainty. The second thing is negatively. Let's say that Rousseau thinks there's going to be a storm coming that's going to wipe out all the berries from the trees and he won't be able to find them after they've been wiped out all around. Well. Well, in that case, his rate of time preference is actually lowered. He's willing to invest in making the axe as soon as possible, regardless of the fact if he doesn't not sure of his output, because of his future output, because he wants to get as many berries as possible, because he's pre he's preparing himself for a, a future supply situation. So we see how the uncertainty factor can go either ways in affecting uh, the rate of time preference, which is very interesting. Now. Another thing to realize with the capital decision is that whenever you make a capital decision, you don't necessarily have to only make it with regards to building an axe. You can actually, when you start investing in a land. And Mary Rothbard in the book really quickly says, like, let's say that Crusoe, you know, he opened up a field and started working on his axe to uh, create his house. But then discovering the island, he finds out that there's a better place where he could have done it, that there's more fishes nearby, there's more sunlight, it's right in front of the beach, you know? And Mary Roper says that at the end of the day, at that point, it's going to determine his subjective preference whether or not he wants to give up that work that he has done in developing that land to now start working on the new land. Depends on his scale of preferences. But the thing is, is that when you understand this, you see that there's no such thing as like access capacity with regards to land. When you see like, let's say in the island, like Crusoe hasn't used up certain land, what does that mean? Crusoe, in essence, hasn't used up that land or that spare land because the amount of present goods that he would have had to give up it now, he values them more, a lot more than the future goods that he would receive in the future from the output of that land. You see, so hence he decides not to invest in that land and cultivate it and make it capital. You know, because land, 
you make it capital. You know, if you just have plain land, boom, then you start cutting it, you start putting water, whatever, and now it becomes capital. And those lands that are not worth the savings or your restriction of consumption are called submarginal lands. That's just a quick point that many Rothbard comes, which in the future, it'll come into play. All right. Now, further implications of capital or the formation of capital. So we understand what determines capital, why capital is important. And one of the most important implications is that capital frees up time. All right? It frees up time for you to pursue other ends. Without capital, you couldn't do so. Let me, let's put it, let me put it to you another way. Let's say that Robinson Crusoe has not built his axe. Right? He hasn't built it. And by him walking around, oh my god, I found an axe. He finds that axe, and he has saved himself 10 hours. Think about that. He no longer has to produce it. So he saved himself 10 hours, which means he can now start getting the berries, and he increases productivity. See how capital, in essence, is a vehicle that speeds up your attainment of your ends. All right, That's how capital works. And now Crusoe, because he found the axe, he has the capability of actually pursuing other ends because he went from a productivity level of 20 berries per hour to 50 berries per hour. Now, that's a huge implication, but another implication which is very important, which May Rothman presents pretty quickly in the chapter, but I decided to present it again just because I think it made more sense in my mind, is that whenever human actors decide to embark in capital investment or in the creation of capital, they're actually lengthening the production structure or the structure of production. They're lengthening the process of production or the amount of time required for you to obtain your final end. You're lengthening that. And by that I mean not necessarily just the per se the production of, let's say, the capital good, but the from the inception that you decide I'm going to build an axe and then I'm going to use that axe to chop off trees. So Originally, it would take you 10 hours to build. And originally, it only took you 10 hours to get your 200 berries. But when you decide to actually embark in the capital investment, you're lengthening the structure of production because now you have one extra step, which is that you need to make the axe. And then when you make the axe, it takes a certain amount of time. With the axe, you have to get the berries afterwards. So you see how the structure of production gets lengthened there. But Let's say that we're already at that point, we made our, our, axe, our axe and we're already cool, okay, we got a certain uh, length of production or structure of production, a certain length of structure of production. The structure of production also lengthens in two ways, depending on which one you decide to invest. Let's say that Crusoe wants to further now increase his productivity from the axe and he wants to increase his productivity from 50 to 100. And he realizes that he could do that by building a machine that basically with the lever scrapes off the, the berries, like boom, super quick. How is the structure of production lengthened there? How, are the, how is the production process lengthened, or the duration, or the amount of hours required lengthened? Well, Mr. Crusoe would have to get the materials again. So the axe, right? He would probably either have to renew it or something. He would get the axe, and then after he gets the axe, he gets the wood, he would have to get some stone, and that, all that requires time. Then he would have to assemble the stone and the wood to make the machine and, and actually pull it, right? And all of this would um, requires a lengthier structure of production. It lengthens the structure of production. So we see that from going from productivity level, just having the axe, to now building a machine, he would have to do extra steps. And you see how the structure of production becomes more complex, and we have goods of different orders. So let's say we would have uh, the machine, right? And the production of the machine is, let's say, third order. And then the axe, which was necessary. No, let's say that the machine was first order producer good, and then the axe necessary was second order producer good. And then the third order producer good would be like the metal and whatever necessary things. Right? You see how the structure of production gets lengthened. But another interesting thing that happens in the structure of production is that with capital, you have to renew it. Right? Because when you have an axe, you start using that axe, that axe gets affected and ha that axe has a certain duration of life, life duration. And maybe uh, the axe is usable for 30 days, let's say. And after 30 days, you have to renew it. Of course, it's not like uh, the axe is like perfect, like, okay, 200 berries per hour, whatever, I mean, f uh, five, uh, 50 berries per hour every day. No, no. 
you actually see it like a, some sort of deterioration. It's not like perfect and boom, down. It's not like that. But once you get to that point and you realize, okay, now I have to dedicate an additional 10 hours for me to uh, have this act again. What if you ask yourself the following question? You ask yourself the question, how do I make even the production of axes more efficient? By you asking this question, then you realize, okay, well, for me to make the axe, I gotta get the, the wood from up there in the trees. But then you realize, what if I create some sort of machine that allows me to get the wood from the tree really quickly? Look at how you're lengthening the production there, all because of the renewal of capital, the renewal of capital goods. You see how basically within each stage you start creating sub-stages, right? Okay, the hammer. I mean, the axe is the stage in the production and getting the berries, right? Because we needed the axe to make the machine, and then the machine got the berries, right? But within the axe itself, the renewal of that axe has a lengthier section of production because you start thinking, how do I make more efficient my production of axes? And you're lengthening the production there. Now, to end all this off, one important thing to realize is that when we decide to embark in these capital projects, right? we're faced with such uncertainty. And when the structure of production starts getting lengthier and lengthier and lengthier and lengthier, the uncertainty increases. Because for instance, let's say, okay, I decide to embark on creating this machine and whatever, but at the end of the day, I don't have the sufficient knowledge to come together that I could fail, right? But it could be the case that I was successful with creating the machine, etc. right? It could be the case that I was successful. But what, if all this, what does all of this take? It takes an act of entrepreneurship. It takes the fact of looking at the future and looking at my environment and making the proper decisions in such a way that I predict are going to, are going to be successful and satisfy my ends. A good entrepreneur is someone who analyzes everything that is happening around him in his environment and accurately predicts the future that dedicates his time in such a way that he will get the results that he wants. And not so good entrepreneur would be the opposite case. But what this shows you is at the end of the day, all human beings are entrepreneurs because all human action is entrepreneurship. Human action is entrepreneurship because human action, you act because you want to go from a less satisfactory state to a more satisfactory state. And that is what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is looking around you is how do I improve my condition, all right? which is a very fundamental truth and you understand that human beings by their nature, by their metaphysical nature, are entrepreneurs. And that's how it applies to the formation of capital. <laughs> well, hopefully all of this made sense. If you have any questions or anything, I'll do my best to respond to them in the comment section. Uh, in essence, what we learned today was that in order for us to form capital, we need savings because it is through those savings that we invest. And we make the capital good, the axe. What is it that, what are the factors that determine whether or not we will go in the production of the axe? Our rate of time preference, the uncertainty factor, and we learned how the structure of production gets also lengthened when we invest in capital goods. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate this. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. It's a lot of material, and I did my best to explain it. For now, have a good day, and until next time.